Why, hello there! It's been a little while since I did one of these, for a lot of real-world reasons I won't get into, but I'm back now, and looking at what I've been painting. Before we go any further, I would like to make a little correction to the last episode. In it, I said the Dystopian Wars minis were sent in by Patrick, when they were, in fact, sent in by Phil and Connor. Big apologies to the pair of you for that gaff. there's a lot of names flying around in these videos, and I just got mixed up. Sorry. Anyway, on with the episode proper. Let's look at some minis. First up is a Rogue Trader era librarian sent in by a person who didn't want to be named that I finally finished after painting half of him like a year ago and then putting him aside. You, you know how it happens. His sword is not actually supposed to be curved, it's supposed to be straight, but when I got it, it was so perfectly bent into a curve that I knew I'd never be able to bend it back, and it looked like it was supposed to be like that anyway, so I just leaned into it. He's also wearing a 3D printed look-alike backpack sent in by Patrick, as you're always struggling to find enough Rogue Trader backpacks for these things. They're like the one separate piece on them, so they go missing very easily. Now he is missing a few grass tufts on his base, but that's just because I always seem to miss when it's either not too hot or too cold to spray some varnish on him, so those will be added whenever I get around to that. Still, it was nice to knock out Lamenta in a very different scheme, as before I did this, I'd been taking a little bit of a break from painting all that yellow. Now here's a Thunder Warrior sent in by Zingbo, and from... Uh, it could be pretty much any time, really. They made these for a really long stretch of time, but they originate in the Rogue Trader era, hence why he's also got one of Patrick's 3D printed backpacks. He's in a Sons of Horus scheme because, well, I felt like it, and I'm quite happy with the visor as I don't tend to go quite that hard on these kind of details normally. All in all, I gotta say I really enjoyed painting this model for saying that I didn't like it that much before doing so. It's just got quite a lot of nice details on there, especially considering the time period it came from. Plus it helped me get some of my wanting to paint Sons of Horus energy out whilst I was waiting for Legion's Imperialis to be released. Next up is a plastic squat sent in by Matt. And he's an interesting chap since it took me a while to identify where the head came from since it's not a squat head and I couldn't find it in the fantasy dwarf range of the time either. But eventually I realised it's from the Psycho Styrene Dwarf, the very first plastic miniature for Warhammer. To that end, I decided to give him a bit of a living ancestor vibe with his little cane, and I painted him in a more desaturated version of the classic squat scheme. It's actually the first non-chaos squat mini I've ever painted, believe it or not. Now, I don't usually do historical minis, but I fancied having a go at painting this one sent in by Reese. It's the Never Surrender Mini that was an exclusive when ordering Bolt Action when it was first released in 2012, representing a couple of British paratroopers. It's also sculpted by Paul Hicks, who I discovered followed me on Twitter. So, uh, hey Paul, S sorry I don't really post on Twitter anymore. Didn't quite have any paint on hand that matched the real world fatigue's colour that well, but with a combination of Steel Legion Drab, a couple of coats of Athonian Camo Shade, and a little dry brushing of Baneblade Brown, I think I got something in the right ballpark. Especially since it's not like the colours were that consistent on real life fatigues anyway. Next we have something sent in by Cameron that I've been meaning to get to for a while, but was putting off since I wanted to give it the time and attention it deserved the Gorka Morka Red Gobbo. As you may guess that, as someone who has a Grot Rebellion army, I've had a soft spot for this mini for quite a long time, so it's nice to finally paint one. It really allows you to appreciate the little details on him. I didn't base him like my usual Grots so that he can one day be magnetised onto a Super Heavy, which is why I also didn't do any red on his coat since there was already plenty on the base, but I think it still works. Definitely one off the bucket list, and an interesting companion to the Red Gobbo I converted a few years back from the Christmas miniature that started my entire army. Another goblin now, this one is a goblin fanatic from... 4th edition Warhammer Fantasy? I think? As ever, I am terrible at knowing when fantasy models come from, feel free to correct me in the comments. This was sent in by Lord Hedgepig, and I thought it would be something a little different to paint. Decided to go extra vibrant with the basing, sort of a how you remember goblin green looking as opposed to how it actually looked, which is a lot more desaturated. 
If you're curious, it was done with a base of moot green, a coat of striking scorpion green contrast, and then dry brushed with the old Citadel golden yellow, followed by dawn yellow. Also from Hedgepig is a couple of Saurus warriors to match the one I painted in a previous video. They all showed up in the Warhammer 1st Edition video, which is why I went with a slightly less vibrant colour scheme. It was alluding to the pre-Goblin Green base era. I gave them lilac tongs though, for some reason. Related to the previous Gobbos are a couple of Foxbox Splosive Nalas that were sent in by... well, them, actually. They were sent in by Fox and Jenny. These are pretty chunky, positively towering over the GW bomb squigs I have. But like all squig adjacent things, their big faces full of teeth were quite fun to paint. Now that they're done, and when I remember, these will be sent off to our friend Hobby Tan's Squig Sanctuary, as they have a collection of rare and unusual squigs, and I think these lads will fit right in there. Also on the non-GW and painted red front, I painted Sasha Kratikov from the War Machine range, sent in by Walter. I've somehow never painted a Privateer Press Mini in any form before, so it was nice to finally do so, and it has left me with a little bit of a hankering to paint a Warjack. It's also, I believe, the first time I've ever painted a model with this kind of style of base. I used to really hate how they looked, they break the illusion a little bit more than I'd like, but I'll be honest, I've mellowed on them a lot, and at this point it's just nice to paint something a little different. So you were probably expecting more epic scale stuff after the last video in this series, and I do not wish to disappoint, plus you've already seen them in the epic video we did a bit ago. To start off, here is a pair of old Falcon Grav Tanks sent in by Adam and Matt. Basically this was me just finding a use for some metallic purple paints that we hadn't found a use for yet. But yeah, it was a quick little paint job to do, and I think it looks quite nice. Like a more pastel version of the purple scheme a lot of the Armorcast Eldar promo models were in. Also from Adam is this Square of Space Marines. These are the plastic ones from the first edition of Space Marine, and as such are a little simpler and smaller than the ones that would follow. They're in Sons of Horus colours since, like the Thunder Warrior earlier, when I painted them I was looking forward to Legion's Imperialis, and that was how I was going to paint mine. And, via the magic of not getting around to making this video for months, hey look, I can compare them to the modern equivalents. Look how they've grown. Oh, and if you're wondering how I did these sandy coloured bases that I've shown today, I just painted over a texture paint with Zemisi Desert, gave it a coat of Reichland Flesh Shade, and then dry brushed it with Screaming Skull. Same with the Legion's bases too, just without the texture paint. Just thought I'd mention that since I know it took me a little bit of experimenting to get that particular kind of look, and I wanted to spare you the time in case you fancy trying it yourself. Now for some more contrast painted Sons of Medusa, originally sent in by Jeremy. And these are the later plastic marines, so they have a bit more detail than those previous ones. Not much to say about these other than they are very, very green, and that my camera hates getting a good picture of them even more so than other epic miniatures. But again, it is quite fun to see how these stick up with the new equivalents. Finally, I've done a bunch more of the orcs that were sent in by Lord Hedgepig, this time concentrating on infantry. So I've got three bases of boys, each with a very large, very red rocket launcher, one squad of knobs, one of commandos, a biker base, and a war boss. Particularly pleased with the war boss, as I was able to pick out a lot of details on there, as well as do a bit of freehand, which is always fun at this scale. Anyway, that is what I have painted recently, or semi-recently, considering how long it's been since the last video. And I realise that I've now reached over a hundred minis painted in this series so far, Sure, the numbers are really pumped up by the relatively quick to paint Battlefleet Gothic and the Epic Minis, but still, it really makes me feel like I'm actually making some progress. Especially since, you know, I have been painting stuff that wasn't sent to me in the PO Box as well. Actually, as this is a bit of fun, and I'm unlikely to show it off on the channel elsewhere, here's a spare marine from the Legion's box that I decided to use as a test if it were possible to paint a Lamenter at this scale, complete with checkered shoulder pad. Turns out the answer was yes but good lord am I not doing it again. Big thanks as ever to those generous buggers who sent in the miniatures for this video, and I will see you all in the next painting log. Which hopefully won't take quite as long to come out.